Hey, tennis fans, you are listening to Matchpoint Canada, the official podcast of Tennis Canada. We're also members of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, and we're thrilled to be joined this week by special guest, former player Mary Jo Fernandez. She had a career high ranking of number four in both singles and doubles. She captured seven career singles titles, 17 in doubles as well. And also made the finals of the 1993 French Open, so there's really no better time than now to welcome her to the <laughs> podcast. Mary Jo, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, as we're speaking now, we have action at, at Roland Garros. Just a, a general sense of, of the tournament. Um, what are your thoughts so far, I guess, through one week of play? At least uh, Mike and I have found it, you know, unusual in a sense because the day sessions have like this amazing atmosphere going on and then we're treated to these new night matches with with no crowd what what have you made of it yeah that's been uh tough to watch the the night match you know usually what the marquee match with the top players i think rafa djokovic roger serena have all played the uh, that night session with nobody in in the stands and i don't know i mean i understand the tv rights and and all that but I think it's tough. I, I don't know why they didn't just wait one more year for when fans could, could be there, you know, with the curfew, I, I understand they're, they're not allowed to be there past nine, but it was, it was weird to, to watch, you know, these matches, especially when, like you said, during the day, you know, there's pretty good atmosphere. It's not full, but you hear the crowd, they're cheering and the players are getting into it. So yeah, it's been a little odd to, to witness uh, those empty stands, you know, at night. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate. Uh, fortunately, I, the, the curfew restrictions will be lifted in a couple of days, so I think we'll return to normalcy. And uh, just getting to some tennis and starting on the women's side, um, at least for me personally watching, uh, Iga Sviantek has really stood out to me as like the player to beat here. She just looks like a clay court powerhouse. Uh, we saw what she did in Rome, just dismantling mm -hmm. Klitschkova in the finals. I'm wondering, do you think this is a player who can not only maybe win this year, but conceivably win the French Open multiple times going forward? I think so. Um, I'm really impressed by her game, by her athleticism. Um, you know, when you think of clay court specialists, not too many come to mind on the women's side. You know, in the past, I remember when Justine Enna played, you say, oh, wow, she's definitely the favorite. You kind of get the feeling with with Sviatek the same the same uh, possibilities because she moves so well on the clay. She's so comfortable sliding. She's very physical on the court, and she hits an extremely heavy ball. Like the she's got a lot of topspin on that forehand. Um, I feel like she, her mentality is is very good for the surface, and she's super young. I mean, she just turned twenty, so she's got many years ahead of her. Um, I agree with you that she's the one to beat. Um, at this year's uh, French Open. Uh, we'll see. I just saw that she won her doubles match uh, with Bethany Maddox-Sands today. They saved seven match points. So uh, she's clearly confident and in, in, the, in the winning mode, but it's gonna take a special, I think a special performance uh, to beat her. But the, there's contenders out there. I've been impressed with uh, Sloane Stevens thus far with Coco, uh, Coco Golf. I think they've been playing very well. So. There's definitely other other players that can challenge her, but she's a front runner at the moment. What well, one player who's no longer in contention, of course, is Naomi Osaka, and uh, that made headlines earlier this mm -hmm. week. Um, you know, she was trying to highlight some mental health issues, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, unfortunately, the blowback was pretty severe from both tennis media and, and a lot of people who were, you know, pretty brave behind their keyboards, I guess, on social media. As a former player and one who you know did plenty of press in, in your day. What was mm -hmm. your take on her decision and then the, the reaction that sort of followed it? So, you know, first of all, I mean, I hope, you know, she's okay. I hope that, um, you know, she's getting the, the necessary treatment or whatever, you know, she needs at the moment. Like Serena said, it's, it's you feel like you need to hug her um, for, for what she's going through. But I feel like maybe it wasn't handled the proper way to begin with. Um, you know, I think, maybe her team could have done a better job of bringing it to the French open and saying what she was going through and, and maybe addressing it that way. I think, you know, putting it out on social media, which I know it's the times and it's what the young, you know, players know, you know, how to handle. I think that was tough. I think that put, I think the tournament on defense a little bit and, you know, to their defense, they're probably thinking, well, we can't have everybody not show up you know, to do their press. 
So their reaction, I thought, was very, very harsh uh, when the four Grand Slams came out and and made their their announcement um, of the severity of, of what could happen in the future uh, if she didn't go to press conferences. And then, you know, to hear her come out and, and say that she suffers from depression and that she wasn't going to play the French Open, you know, that was tough. It, it was, you know, for me, it was sad that it, it came down to that. So hopefully everybody learned. Um, but the most important thing uh, by far is, you know, that she's okay. And that, you know, during, you know, these tough couple of years now with, uh, you know, with COVID and, and isolation and, and everything that everybody's had to go through that people really do address um, mental health and, and what, you know, not just athletes, but what everybody's going through. So um, we'll see, you know, we'll see going forward, but I just, I just hope that everybody involved just has a little more patience, a little bit more understanding and uh, can communicate. I think that that would be the, the best way to put it, that everybody needs to communicate better. Yeah, well said. And, and you've been on both sides of the equation, of course, as a player and now in the media as well. Uh, I want to look back on a positive note, of course, to your run at the French Open in 1993 mm -hmm. and, and how many special memories must come back to you each time of year when the tournament's going on in Paris. What do you recall from that fortnight, those two weeks, and, uh, and that you can share with our listeners? Yeah, um, that was a special year for sure. Um, it's ironic because probably the match that stands out the most, you know, in my mind and in my career is the one I came back in the quarterfinals against my good friend, uh, Gabriella Sabatini. I was down 6-1, 5-1, uh, saved five match points and ended up winning 10-8 in the third, which was incredible. Um, but you kind of felt like, okay, then it, it should be meant to be, right? Like I, I came back from the brink of defeat and, you know, maybe this is my, my chance to win the French Open. I ended up beating Sanchez Vicario, who was a clay court specialist and won a few French Opens in the semis quite handily. And then I had a lead. I had a lead for the first time against Steffi Graf. Uh, I think I was up 4-2 in the third and then didn't win. So it turned out to be like bittersweet. I had a great run, but then it was really tough not to get to the finish line and, and get that victory. Um, but all in all, just, you know, a great memory, a great experience. Um, it's one of my favorite tournaments. I had some of my best results at the French Open. What a tough trifecta, those three players, my goodness, Sabatini, Sanchez, <laughs> and then Graf. I know, I know. You also had, uh, obviously, uh, amazing memories at the Olympics, two doubles gold medals uh, in Barcelona, Atlanta, bronze as well in 1992. And uh, currently, I, I mean, we're hopeful we can see the Olympics this summer in Tokyo, but it's very much up in the air. How important was that stop in your career? How much did you prioritize it, I guess, on the calendar? And uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the idea of, of holding the Olympics and, and tennis players attending for this summer? Yeah, no, the Olympics was definitely a priority uh, for me. And I think for most uh, Americans, for sure, that was a goal to try to, you know, get on that team and, 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 and make the cut. Um, you know, looking back, I just remember feeling very fortunate to be in the sport that we're in because a lot of these other athletes, you know, had those few seconds, whether in a race or in a, you know, swimming competition. Um, I remember, uh, meeting someone in the village that missed the bus to their to their event and couldn't compete and they had been practicing for four years for this one moment so I felt fortunate that tennis you always have next week um you know we have the four big ones in the year and then you still have other big ones uh, to follow so that was something that gave me perspective but you know maybe appreciate that we were a small part of a huge event you had to pinch yourself just that you were there at the olympics opening ceremonies day i'll never forget uh especially 92 in barcelona the dream team was there so that was pretty special um and obviously winning the medals is was icing on the cake uh had a great partner in gg fernandez one of the best uh doubles players to ever play and it was it was fun. I mean, Barcelona, we played against um, the Spanish team in the in the final. I remember the king and queen uh, showed up midway through the match and it turned the match around. We were winning and then all of a sudden we started losing and we were like, oh, my gosh, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with the crowd? But we found a way. And then obviously winning at home was very, very special. 
And of course, it's a, it's the ultimate international event, the Olympics. And uh, we've been talking about our sport, uh, the sport of tennis. Obviously, we're a Canadian tennis podcast and never have we been you know, so excited as a tennis nation than we have been over the past mm-hmm. few years, um, men's and women's side. And yep. uh, just touching on some of our women's players, of course, Bianca Andrescu, a champion at the U.S. Open. Layla Fernandez is sort of emerging right now. And then, of course, we have top players on the men's side. What, what have you made? of of Canada's run in tennis over the past you know handful of years and do you recall ever like taking Canada seriously as a tennis nation during your career yeah no we had a lot of good uh players from Canada when I was playing I grew up playing with Carling Bassett so she was uh she lived in Florida and we played in the juniors a bit um so she was a, a star of the game but nowadays I have to say the young players are coming on strong I mean with Dennis and Felix on the, on the men's side doing so well and pushing each other um, I think that's fantastic obviously you had you know Milos Raonic for many years now uh, at the top of the game and, and that's been great and the women I mean I love uh, Bianca Andreescu's game I think a little bit like Sviatek she's a great athlete it's a heavy ball really knows how to, how to play different game styles. Um, you know, the big question mark is staying healthy. Uh, she just hasn't played enough consistently week in and week out. But when she puts it together, she's very tough to beat. Layla has been impressive too. She's not, doesn't seem as strong as, as Andrescu physically, but she's quick and uh, she's a smart player on the court. So no, it's exciting times, I think for Canada. Um, and I think, you know, the more you can compete against each other and push each other, the better it is. That, that's what we've seen in the U.S. through the years as well. When, when you have a group of, of young players uh, coming up at the same time that are doing well and, and pushing each other, you know, each one always thinks, OK, if they can do it, I can do it. We want to ask you about a couple of the all time greats um, whose French Open just came to an end recently. I'll talk about Roger and then let Ben mm-hmm. ask you about Serena um, for Federer kind of. Uh, exceeded his own expectations it seemed like from the way he was talking in press making it through those uh, first rounds but ultimately decided you know in an effort to protect his body and his knee preparing mm-hmm. for his ultimate goal in Wimbledon that he decided to step away and uh, withdraw from the event what's your take on his decision here and obviously you've got a close relationship through uh, your husband who's his agent yeah I'm, I'm not asking for any inside info <laughs> unless you want to share well, of course I'm not but there. I'm not there, so I don't have a ton of inside information. Um, but I do know that, yes, he, um, you know, he was looking to see physically how he was going to hold up, really. I mean, he hasn't played in over a year. Um, he had two knee surgeries. He's almost 40. Uh, he played the one match in Geneva uh, where he lost to Andujar. And, you know, I think he said from the start, you know, my goal is, is to try to get ready for the grass court season. That's when he feels his season will begin. Um, and he wanted to, to see how I think his knee was going to react, how his body was going to react. Um, I didn't get to watch a lot of that match yesterday, uh, but apparently it was physical. It was grueling. Um, and it's the most I think he's played in a while. So, you know, beating Chilich in four, winning this tough one in four, I think for him, you know, he knows his body better than anyone. And, and um, for him, I think it's the right decision to, to take, you know, some time off now and hopefully, you know, be fresh for the grass and hopefully his knee holds up and, and he can play, you know, the full grass court season. But, um, you know, I just love how much he loves to play. I love how, you know, everybody was writing me yesterday saying, oh, my gosh, it's so sad. Nobody's watching him. You know, he's almost 40. What is he doing? Like, is he going to just be like, what is this? You know, what am I doing here? And he fought, you know, he, he gave it his all and he found a way. And I don't think he, he probably played his best, but he dug really deep um, at this stage in his career. That's pretty admirable. Yeah. And that's what he sort of shared, I think, on his social media after uh, competing for the love of the game. And, and sort of he, he also talked about feeling like he had millions watching, you know, through their television screens, watching that third round match. And <laughs> I guess you put it in a wider context, talking about a 39 year old coming off of knee surgery, making mm-hmm. the round of 16 at the French Open is is truly incredible. And we'll we'll see what he can do at Wimbledon. Uh, as for another all time great on, on the women's side, Serena Williams, this looked like a great opportunity for her at the French Open, the way the draw was kind of breaking down around her, but uh, she falls to uh, Elena Rabakina in straight sets. Do you think that quest for number 24 weighs on her mentally? Is that an issue or, or are there just too many great players in the women's game right now? 
Well, the competition is definitely difficult. I also think the French Open was never going to be her best chance at, at winning another major. Um, you know, her serve gets negated quite a bit. She doesn't mm -hmm. get those easy, quick points. Um, you know, and even from the baseline, you know, she's got to really work the point a lot longer. I felt like she got better, though, uh, with each match. I didn't get to see um, the match today uh, where she lost. But I think, she, you know, like Roger, I think she's got her eye, you know, on Wimbledon and the U.S. Open. I think that's where she has her best chance. She's been so close since having her daughter a few years ago. So I still think she can do it. Um, it's not going to be easy, but I, I still think that, you know, she's a champion. And listen, let's give her so much credit that she also is out there, you know, trying to break records, trying to, to keep going at this stage in her career. I mean, she doesn't need to do it. She's done it all. You know, she's going to be the greatest regardless if she wins another Grand Slam or not. And, you know, she's pushing herself and she's determined. And I, I feel like she'll do it. I really do. Um, I felt like she looked fitter uh, during this French Open and was moving pretty well. She did have that strap on her leg. And maybe that was a, a bit of an issue today, um, slowing her down just a bit. But I think she got enough matches. Uh, I'll be curious. She normally doesn't play anything on the grass before Wimbledon. I'll be curious if she decides to enter a tournament and, and try to get a couple matches on the grass. But um, with her serve and her game style, I think Wimbledon is where she's going to be the most, uh, the most dangerous. It's so remarkable to me to see these great athletes like her and Roger who are still going into their late 30s, early 40s now. And I turned 40 last summer and I could get through an hour of rec tennis without something hurting. So <laughs> it's I know, really amazing. And you, 40s when everything goes downhill, all the aches and pains come out. So get ready. Oh, well, thanks for that positive news. Um, <laughs> when I was growing up, uh, I mean, I, I watched your generation. That's what hooked me on tennis. And yet, you know, your crowd sort of, you know, ended their career more late 20s, early 30s, mm -hmm. as I believe you did. Yep. Did you ever have imagined going like an extra five ten years or for you I think it was 29 was that you'd given enough to the sport at that point yeah I think the difference is we started so much sooner um you know I started playing play some pro tournaments at 13 I turned pro at 14 uh so 14 15 years you know uh, at your career at you know tennis was pretty good um I had an injury towards the end of my career I had wrist surgery and that I think was a big part of, of me slowing down and, and, and wanting to to start a new chapter in my life. Um, the rehab was getting tough. It was draining and not knowing if you were going to be hundred percent each day. So I think nowadays players are starting a little bit later. Um, the teams are that much more professional and you have, it's funny. I was talking to my sister about it yesterday. They have people taking care of them now, you know, like mm -hmm. people, the physios, the trainers, um, you know, there's so much more involved. I mean, I, barely warmed up before my match and I definitely didn't do anything after my matches where now it's like a proper warm up. It's like a workout. And then afterwards, the cool down and the ice baths. And there's just a lot more going into taking care of their bodies and, and, and everything involved. So I think, yeah, the longevity is definitely a lot better now. Um, at the time, no, I could never have imagined playing into my, into my late thirties. Uh, but I think if I was playing now, I definitely would. Yeah, back then it was just so rare to have, you'd have a Martina or a Jimmy Connors, which would be like the, the very rare instance. Exactly. And kudos to them for doing it at that time as well. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask one last one. I don't know if you might have one too, but uh, you played against Steffi Graf a lot. Mm -hmm. You played mm -hmm. against Serena Williams as well. Mm -hmm. Who was, was tougher for you to face between those two great female tennis players? Oh, well, I got Serena early in her career. I mean, she had already, I think, won a major, but it was still, you know, soon where, you know, she made some mistakes here and there. Um, and I got her at the French. So I got her on a surface where I had a, a better chance um, to return the serve and get into rallies. Steffi was really tough for me. Um, she just had that combination of a lethal aggressive slice that kept the ball low and then you had to hit up and then she'd run around and, and hit her forehand so hard. I remember getting tired in the warm up against Steffi. <laughs> she played at such a, a, such a faster pace than everybody else um, that you knew you were in for it, you know, immediately. So very different game styles. I mean, if you put Serena at her best and Steffi at the best, it's, it's a pretty tough, it's a tough call because then you got everything firing on, on all cylinders. I'll bet.
Yeah, just uh, lastly, I mean, we love hearing your, your commentary and perspective on the sport. And of course, that's one of the reasons we've had you on the podcast here. Uh, when when do you expect you'll you'll be next kind of on the road physically at a tournament? What, what, are, what are the plans, I guess, for the rest of 2021 right now? Well, we're hoping, fingers crossed, the ESPN is going to Wimbledon. Um, so we're excited about that. We're hoping that uh, the restrictions will be a little bit uh, less uh, strict and that, you know, the whole team will be there and we'll be, you know, calling the, the biggest tournament of the year. So we're, we're excited to, to, to be back on the road, you know, Australia, we covered it from Bristol, uh, which was nice, but it's always much better when, when you're at the, at the event live. Yeah, certainly. Uh, Mary Jo, thanks uh, so much for coming on Matchpoint Canada. We always uh, appreciate your insight in the game and of course your great career as well. No, thank you both for having me. I really appreciate it.